started, I do need to mention that this meeting is being uh, recorded. So if you do not wish for your image to be recorded, please turn off your camera. Uh, welcome to the workshop, uh, Reimagining the Museum, Difficult Objects. I am Daniela Bleichmar. I am a professor of art history and history at the University of Southern California and the director of the Levan Institute for the Humanities and the USC Society of Fellows in the Humanities. And I am one of the organizers of this workshop together with my colleague Nancy Lutkehaus, from whom you will be hearing shortly. Um, uh, this workshop is sponsored by the Levan Institute for the Humanities and by the USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute. And I want to thank in particular the Levan's assistant director, Isabella Carr, uh, for all her work on this workshop. Um, this online workshop brings together university-based and museum-based scholars and professionals to discuss some of the ways in which museums collect, display, and narrate cultures past and present, with a focus on objects that prove particularly resistant, provocative, recalcitrant, non-conforming, what we are calling difficult objects, and why that is. Uh, whether we're talking of fakes or fragments, of decaying materials, of taxonomic challenges, of troubling histories or disputed ownership, of undesirable presence and undisplayable states, unruly objects, a, a phrase suggested by uh, the anthropologist uh, Fernando Dominguez Rubio, uh, can be particularly useful things to think with, opening up analytic and theoretical possibilities for understanding, confronting, and reimagining the museum as an institution and the museum exhibition as a way of knowing. And our interests are uh, interdisciplinary, comparative, cross-cultural. We are interested in the long history of collections and on the trajectories uh, that objects take across time, across space, across cultures, and how their meanings change through those trajectories uh, on questions of epist epistemology, of ontology, and of uh, taxonomy. And um, now I will pass it to my colleague Nancy, who is somewhere in this impossible grid. Hello. Hi, there you are. <laughs> yes. Well, First of all, I'd like to add my thanks to all of you for joining us today. This workshop will hopefully provide a much needed diversion from things that are going on around us that are beyond our control. At the same time, it's hard these days not to read the news about yet another controversy at a museum whether the recent pushback against the decision to postpone the Philip Guston retrospective, the case in Paris against several African men who attempted to steal an African funeral pole from the Musée du Quai Branly, or the debate surrounding the 19th century daguerreotypes of Southern slaves made by the Harvard zoologist Louis Agassiz. All of these controversies relate to difficult objects and museums. And all of them have different specific reasons they're difficult, but all of them are centered on issues of race. In our present racially and politically divided world, we're still dealing with the legacy of slavery and colonialism as represented by or embodied in objects. Thus, we're seeing objects that were formerly not considered difficult become difficult, as many of our presenters today will attest to. As an anthropologist, I've been interested in studying objects from non-Western societies and their metamorphosis into fine art. How and why an object that was once considered to be difficult or ugly or pagan or primitive metamorphosizes into fine art or cultural heritage and then becomes difficult again. As Danielis pointed out, these are historically specific questions about changes in value and meaning. The urgent and clarion call to decolonize the museum is both a demand to unlearn imperialism, as Ariella Azoulay suggests, as well as an imperative to make objects difficult in new ways. I look forward to today's presentations about what makes objects difficult and to the discussions afterwards that they'll provoke among us 
as well as to leaving this workshop today, not only having met or <laughs> at least seen many new faces, but also having gained insight into new ways museum curators and scholars can think about and deal with difficult objects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, so uh, we are going to get started and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format because uh, we are uh, all of us experimenters with Zoom, right? And so uh, this um, meeting has allowed us to bring together uh, nine uh, wonderful speakers, but also uh, at this point, 150 of you, of us, uh, for this conversation. So uh, we are excited to think together, uh, to think collaboratively is, is something that is very central to our thinking of this workshop uh, uh, and of these issues. And so what we're going to do is the following. Uh, we have invited nine speakers to speak for only five minutes each, and we're going to be just so ruthless about the timekeeping. Um, and we have asked each of them to stick to a format where they are presenting, they're sharing with us one difficult object and uh, using the presentation to use that object uh, to think beyond the object, to think about what questions it raises uh, for this category of difficult objects. So we're just going to have these rapid fire presentations. We're going to be very informal. Uh, these are, uh, uh, if we introduce each of the speakers listing all their publications and exhibitions, that would take the entire hour and a half. So we're going to be very, very uh, quick and informal, and we're going to let them talk about their objects. And once they finish, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, all of us, uh, go into small groups to have 15 minutes of conversation about the issues that were raised by the presenters and about issues that the group wishes to uh, bring up. And we're going to uh, have a shared Google Doc uh, in which we're going to ask a person in each group to take notes uh, of the conversation. And we're going to invite all of you to add your comments, to add your ideas and your suggestions uh, uh, for this conversation and also thinking uh, for future uh, conversations. And then we're going to uh, come back for a final uh, uh, closing discussion. And given the number of participants, we're not going to have time to hear uh, from everyone. So we have asked uh, four of our participants to give very quick or very brief uh, closing comments. So we're going to hear from Mary Miller, director of the Getty Research Institute, from Fernando Dominguez Rubio, associate professor of anthropology at UC San Diego, from Marnie Sandweiss, professor of history at Princeton University, and from Deborah Silverman, professor of art history and history at UCLA, uh, who will be uh, taking on the impossible task of sort of bringing together uh, in, in, in whatever form uh, this uh, wide ranging conversation. Um, so that is uh, uh, what uh, we will do. And I am now going to um, invite uh, our speakers, if I can find them. <laughs> Oh, this is like teaching, but in front of colleagues, it's even worse. Um, okay, I'm going to share the presentation that I know how to do. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. Okay. Ah, perfect. Give me one second while I figure out what is going wrong. I am sorry about this. <laughs> 
Okay. Okay, so um, here we are. So our first uh, speaker is Dennis Scar, the Virginia Steele Scott Chief Curator of American Art at the Huntington Library, Art Museum and Botanical Garden. Dennis. We and you so we can unmute you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I just needed to be unmuted there. Uh, it's great to be here. Daniela and Nancy, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I've been at the Huntington uh, since January, but today I wanted to choose an object for my time at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where I was a curator for 13 years. Daniela, can you advance the slides? So the object I chose today is a ceramic pitcher from around 1840. Um, it was made in Medford, Massachusetts. It's one of four that survives. They all seem to have been cast from the same mold, but they're decorated with a slightly different uh, slip glaze. Um, it was on loan to the MFA for a number of years, and we first put it on view in 2010, and then later the museum acquired it for the permanent collection in 2016. Um, initially, it was thought to represent the figure of Toussaint Louverture, who is the Haitian leader of the first successful uh, slave insurrection that led to the Haitian Revolution um, in the Americas at the end of the 18th century. However, recent research that a number of colleagues and I have been working on suggests that the picture was instead relate to the ship Amistad. Uh, you may remember the case from 1839 of a group of enslaved Mende men and women who overthrew their captors um, on the Spanish ship La Amistad. They wound up imprisoned in New Haven, Connecticut, and their case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, Matthew McConaughey played their lawyer in the movie Amistad. Anthony Hopkins was uh, John Quincy Adams, so you may know the story from there. Um, the case of the Mendane uh, captives generated intense public interest at the time and a fundraising effort was undertaken to return them to Africa. Uh, portraits were drawn of the captives while they were in New Haven. Images of them and portrait busts were made and circulated widely. Um, images also appeared in published books from 1840 and later, and also newspaper accounts. They even took um, plaster casts of the heads of all of the individuals. And these circulated as part of a wax museum uh, that toured the East Coast and New England. Um, and also phrenological studies of each of the captives were made and their different um, personality types were published uh, in a book in the period. And then at the conclusion of the court case, uh, performances were staged throughout New England and the East Coast um, to raise money to return uh, many of them to Africa. And it's believed that this object might date to around uh, the same time, and it might have been part of the fundraising effort, but it's not clear. So despite whatever well-meaning intention uh, was behind all of these fundraising efforts, um, if this picture does in fact relate to the Amistad, objects like this, though, are problematic today um, in that um, they may be read as racist, even or offensive, or having have grotesque imagery. Um, and in fact, abolitionist objects Many of them during the 19th century often included uh, racist depictions. So an object like this has, it, it sits uncomfortably within a museum context and can be very difficult to interpret uh, to the public, especially if visitors um, see it in a certain way or have a visceral reaction to it before they've um, read any of the contextual information about it. 
Um, so how can a museum create sufficient context around it um, and to lay out for the visitors clearly the difficult and complex historical moment in which it was made? So you can advance to the questions, Daniela. So I had three questions related to this. One, um, what are the responsibilities of museums in collecting and displaying potentially offensive objects? What strategies can museums effectively employ to interpret objects with challenging or complicated histories? especially given limited space for text and didactics. Um, and finally, what meaningful context can an art museum in particular offer an object uh, like this? And I have just a few readings um, at the end, Daniela. One relates to um, the story of this object when it was first attributed to Toussaint Louverture. Um, there was a good book that came out in 2020 about um, the abolitionist movement, and it's called Selling Anti-Slavery, which relates to kind of the mass media and mass culture of the abolitionist movement in the 19th century. And then finally, um, a, a good uh, book of essays called Creating, or Curating Difficult Knowledge, Violent Pasts in uh, Public Places. So I direct you all uh, to those sources, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Josh Garrett Davis, Gamble Associate Curator of Western History, Popular Culture, and Firearms at the Autry Museum of the American West. And Josh, you can unmute uh, yourself. All right, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you all for organizing this and inviting me. It's wonderful. Yeah, as, as Daniela said, uh, my name is Josh Garrett Davis from the Autry Museum here in Los Angeles. Um, our museum and my own home here are located on unceded Tongva Gabrielino homelands, as is USC and the Huntington. Um, and uh, we're privileged at, at the museum to be able to learn from and work with a number of Tongva folks on all sorts of projects, including a consideration of my selected difficult object today. Um, just a little background before we get to it. Our um, our museum is uniquely complicated and difficult in that it is a merger of two museums. One was originally called a Museum of Western quote unquote heritage, a celebratory, but always at least somewhat critical examination of the American conquest of this half of the continent. And the other is the oldest museum in Los Angeles, the Southwest Museum, which had a very broad focus and collection originally, but eventually evolved into a pretty standard ethnographic museum of quote unquote the American Indian singular always as they put it. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see, but the t-shirt the I'm wearing kind of brings to, to, together these in that it's a skeleton cartoon of John Wayne, uh, satire by a Tongva artist, which I'll show you, I'll be <laughs> So you can advance to the, to the object. Now that people are joining. Um, so my, my difficult object today is a small uh, museum diorama from the ethnic, ethnographic part of art history. It's a pretty standard sort of artifact seen here packaged for its move to our new research center. Um, and it purports to depict appropriately enough Tongva people at some hazy point in the past right here in Southern California on, on Catalina Island. Um, and as most of you know, this tradition of museum practice is riddled with problems in that it imagined indigenous people as static locked in the past and behind glass in addition to being frequently inaccurate as to details um, that are dehumanizing objects many many people feel the indigenous people feel as they visit museums of course um, and they inf they may invite an imagined kind of white visitor to play god um, and so on um, and yet dioramas remain appealing to some people as a form uh, they dramatize history they they invite a sort of close looking, especially in these small ones, uh, and potentially empathy, though that's doubtful or, or problematic in itself. Um, they, they offer at least some sort of context for cultural objects as compared to a sort of white cube approach. Uh, and they're frequently uh, artworks by invisible women artists who labored in museums. I don't know the artist for this one yet, uh, but many of our museum dioramas were made by a couple of women artists between about the 1910s and the 1940s. Several were funded by the federal government's Workers' Progress Administration during the Great Depression. And um, some Native people have told me they have a love-hate relationship with these types of dioramas as both enchanting and de dehumanizing objects. Uh, so you can advance to the slide. So that's the backdrop and then the, the, the base of the, 
Um, so the questions that I uh, listed here are sort of about whether these kinds of techniques, and I'm thinking of dioramas, and also museum forms like a cabinet of curiosities or sort of orientalist or Indianist fascination kind of displays, should just be warehoused, or some might even say destroyed, um, or whether they can productively be displayed uh, in the interest of institution self-critique or cultivating critical conversations with the public. Um, and are, I've seen some of these playing out in sort of uh, new ways or critic, self-critical ways in some institutions. Um, and are, are there redeemable aspects to these types of techniques? Or would this just create sort of inside baseball or uh, sort of types of uh, kind of self critiques that most visitors aren't interested in. So the next slide is um, some of the readings that I suggested kind of along the, um, the history of dioramas, the first two related to the American Museum of Natural History New York's kind of annotation of a life-size diorama. There's a video there on YouTube as well as the article in New York Times, um, an article about uh, these types of dioramas on a website called The Appendix, and then a sort of review of a sort of new um, a kind of cabinet of curiosities, globalist approach, as well as Amy Lone Tree's kind of now classic decolonizing museums. So thank you all. I look forward to talking more. Perfect timing. Uh, thank you, Josh. Our uh, next uh, speaker is Rebecca Hall, curator at the USC Pacific Asian Museum. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, very good. So uh, first I wanna thank Daniela and Nancy for including me in this, uh, this uh, discussion today. I actually, and then thank you to my fellow panelists for, for their contributions. I'm gonna use my presentation to call attention to the difficulty of, of fakes. Uh, Daniela, can you forward the next slide? So here you see an object that's actually not in the Pacific Asia Museum's collection. It was actually, it was offered to us as a donation and I was incredibly excited about this object when it came uh, into me because uh, it resembles very closely a 19th century image um, in style. If you look at the texture of, of this um, figure's garment and the way that his face looks and all of those details uh, are very much uh, the central, uh, the, the middle of the 19th century, what you expect to see. And of course, what it's depicting in that uh, it might look to you like a, a Buddha or, or a Buddhist figure, but in fact, we're seeing Shiva standing on the bull Nandi. And it was a very surprisingly popular image in uh, mid 19th century Thailand in, in Bangkok in that it was actually depicting the story of the Buddhist power over Shiva. Uh, but it, it really wasn't well known to scholars um, until, for me anyway, I became familiar with this type of object. You see the small thing in your, in your left-hand corner is actually a, an object from the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco from a catalog from an exhibition about 10 years ago where I first learned about this kind of object. And I was so excited that something like it might be coming into our museum. Now, Pam does not have a strong Southeast Asia collection. And Southeast Asia is my specialty. Uh, and something I have incredible affection for and, and passion. And so I was excited at the possibility of pursuing this object as a donation. But that excitement blinded me. I did not look closely at it. And after talking with other scholars and curators who have a lot more experience with this type of Thai sculpture, it became very obvious to me that this is a 20th century fake. And it became obvious because they told me emphatically that it is, but if you look at other pictures I don't have included and even the pictures I do, the way that it's patinaed, there's some deliberate kind of abrasions on the object. And the way even that the gold leaf is worn off on it is, is very regular and very different, for instance, from the one we see in the lower left. And if you look at the, the proportions, he's kind of leaning a little bit, that's suspect, and his face is also very different from what you expect from from the 19th century. And so, so I was surprised uh, to hear this in part because I associate Southeast Asian fake art, fake sculptures with the Khmer Empire, um, stone images with Burmese wood images and Thai cast bronze um, Buddha images from the Sukhothai period. Uh, and so I thought it was things that 
collectors are known to pursue, but clearly it's more expansive than that. And it's a huge issue. It can only be confirmed by science and conservators um, to really know for sure that it's a fake. You can have the idea that it is, but science confirms that. And so, but it's an amazing object, right? And so Daniela, next slide, please. So I have a lot of questions, um, questions that I ask myself about this subject, questions that I think we can all contemplate. Um, but it's really about how we think about what fakes are. Can we separate fakes from the issues of the art market and the demand for these rare historic objects? Because it's really the art market that created this type of production in Southeast Asia. Uh, if that demand changes, will the production of fakes come to an end? What role can fakes and forgeries play in a museum's permanent collection? And can we find positive methods for presentation? And because they often are discussed in a very negative way, but they're produced over a long period of time and the people who make them are quite skillful. And so can we have meaningful discussions about how they contribute to our understanding of art and culture? Uh, and do we think differently about fakes and forgeries depending on where they're from or when they were made or who made them? And so it's a lot about how we discuss this and can we change the way we talk about this? Do they have value uh, as objects in them themselves? And Daniela, next slide, please. So I have quite a few suggested readings here. Um, the first by Chang Qing is actually about uh, Chinese uh, fake objects and it's really wonderful discussion of how you can look at things and the different contexts um, of, of fakes. The next one is actually about a, a Cambodian um, sculpture that was thought to be a fake, but in fact is not. The next two actually date to 1943, and they tell you the issue of fakes come earlier, and I've run out of time, but the other ones are actually newspaper articles talking about where you can go to see fakes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, our uh, next uh, speaker is Laurel Kendall, uh, who is curator and chair of the Division of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. Thank you, Daniela. Um, I'm going to introduce my objects through two ethnographic stories. If I could have the object slide. At the turn of the last century, Valdemir Jokelson um, described the acquisition of a shaman's robe from the Yukagir Yegor Shamanov, um, an object he lay, subsequently identified as AMNH 70 slash 8489. And he writes, how, quote, he sold it to me after much persuasion on the part of the chief. When the deal was concluded, he passed the money over to the latter and in silence left the tent where the purchase was arranged. As I was informed later, he was crying because he had been deprived of the hereditary shamanic dress in which he saw the main source of his shamanic power. In other words, without the dress, the shaman would no longer fly. All right, I have been troubled by this story as the curator of the collection that contains the shaman of robe. Fast forward to 1998, I am standing in front of our, ex our exhibit commemorating the um, 100th anniversary of the Jessup North Pacific Expedition. I am standing with Gavriel Karilov, a poet of the Yukagir people and grandson of Yegor Shamanov. And I try to explain to him through a very wonky um, interpreting process the efforts we went to to prepare his grandfather's robe for exhibition. And Gavril says to me, don't have anything to do with it. It's dangerous. But I already had something to do with it. This is story number two. While the conservators were working on the robe, I found myself in Cambridge, England, in the company of Alexandra Tsurkova, whose grandfather, had, whose father had also been a shaman, who was herself pursuing that path in post-Soviet times. And I explained that we were going to exhibit this robe and I asked her if there were anything we ought to do to it ritually before putting it on exhibit. And she said, what people? I said, you could gear. She said, oh, you could gear ski. And she uh, fumbled in her very uh, capacious handbag and handed me some fragrant grass from the Yuka gear country. She said, burn this and speak to the shaman from your heart, tell him what you intend for the exhibit. 
I went back, I talked to the conservator. She said, cool, we arranged for this. We covered the robe with a drop cloth to protect it from any falling ash. We turned off the smoke detector and I spoke to the shaman from my heart. Um, if this were to happen today, we would not have to turn off the smoke detector because the American Museum of Natural History now has a smudge room. Um, our director of collections and archives, now retired Paul Bielitz, had noted that there were frequent requests, particularly from Native Americans, to spend some time alone with objects and to smudge them. This usually meant taking them outside. He designed a beautiful room with a beautiful view. Um, there's a brazier. The uh, room responds to heat, but not to smoke. And people can smoke things. People can spend time alone. People uh, repatriating individuals, ancestors can spend time with the ancestors in the room quietly if they so desire. Tibetans have used the room. Various Siberian visitors have used the room. I've been smoked in the room. And that takes me then to my questions. And I have front stage questions and I have backstage questions. Um, the backstage questions, how does a transforming museum practice address the life of an object, however that life may be understood? How how do we deal with things amid the practicalities, the day-to-day -day work of a museum? And can museum records better reflect object lives? We're very lucky. We have the incident from Jokelson. We have the name of the shaman. We have several other robes. Uh, one of them has a name attached. Two others do not. They're lost histories. And then the front stage, a, a concern about how things like shamanic practice are displayed. For many years, we had a very effective um, exhibit of a shaman ritual, which uh, the descendant community, the Yakut, the Sakha people, really loved when Sakha scholars came to New York. And the reason for this was they were very proud of their shamanic heritage, which they were recouping in post-Soviet times, but uh, they had seen that same tradition reviled in Soviet era museums, and they were very happy to see a very proud shaman at work. But is it possible to display these things without cliche, uh, with respect to the subject's complexity, and yet at the same time allowing our audiences, making things accessible? I think a large part of the answer to all of this is going to be wrapped up into the kinds of conversations we have with descendant communities, with native scholars, etc. It's an unfolding process. The answers are going to be multiple, and I'd love to share experiences with people. Um, next, the sources. Um, okay. Um, Anita Hurl, this is a 1994 article, but it's a lovely case study of how um, the Cambridge Anthropology Museum was able to work with a shaman of the Agurung shaman and how he left his, his stuff with the museum, but was able to take it out so, uh, periodically to, when he needed to use it and the different kinds of compromises the museum had to make and a very practical understanding of how far a museum could go with that. Michelle Maunder, this is a fairly classic piece, again, on the issues that come up in the conservation of sacred objects, and, and she extends that to discussions of storage. Um, the Raymond Silverman book, and in particular, uh, an essay by Paul Topsell about um, a touring of objects to Maori communities. Uh, the sense of an evolving and emergent museum practice that is cognizant of the lives of things and the lives of those whose ancestors made or used such things. And a pitch for a forthcoming book of mine, the, the Afterlives chapter in an exploration of objects. And I'm done. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do it that way, but you, <laughs> it, it worked out perfectly. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, 
Our uh, next speaker is uh, Barbara uh, Kirschenblatt Gimblet, who's the Ronald S. Lauder Chief Curator of the core exhibition of the Polish Museum of the uh, History of Polish Jews. Barbara. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first slide, please. So what I'd like to do is to talk about a type of object, which are these little, uh, these little Jewish figurines. And um, it's thought that there are more of these little wooden Jewish figurines in Poland today than there are living Jews. They are ubiquitous, they're found everywhere. And they have a life um, in the world and they have a life in museums. They are very difficult objects and they hold a very different valence for particularly for Jewish visitors to Poland who see them as anti-Semitic and for locals who buy them at Easter fairs and who have them in their shops and in their homes and who consider them to be lucky and to bring luck. Um, so in Polish, they're called Zhitki, uh, these little Jewish figurines, they're, they come, they, they, don't, they, don't, they not only appear in three-dimensional form uh, as you see here, in all shapes and sizes. Usually it's a very stereotypical looking Jew holding a bag of money or a gold coin or some other, some other indication and they are believed to bring luck um, uh, and they also take the form of, of paintings. So they, they present a number of really, really interesting issues. And if we can go to the next uh, image, please. And we even find them life-size as a kind of a mannequin. This is in a restaurant um, in, um, this is in a restaurant in Lodz that has not only this life-size kind of wax mannequin with a prayer shawl of all things, sitting in front of a cash register with a drawer open filled with gold coins. Um, and and the, the restaurant itself is filled. It's a kind of a museum of these figurines. Um, in all shapes and sizes, including a man that's, that sits in the restaurant and paints little paintings that are exactly the same motif. Uh, next, please. And so uh, my, my interest is in the basically strategies for dealing with them because they, they also exist in museums and it, they exist particularly in the ethnographic museum in Krakow where they, they are part of a tradition at Easter markets where they're purchased and oftentimes they jiggle and they are kind of like praying Jews or they are these, these lucky Jews. And my interest in them is, are some strategies for, for attending with them. So, um, and, and they're the, the strategies that I think are of particular interest are in the museum itself, uh, in the case of the Ethnographic Museum. And here I would cite the work of Erica Lehrer who actually has worked for years to get the Ethnographic Museum to recognize the nature of their collection. That, that, that is to say that the attitudes towards these, uh, the attitude towards these objects really range from, I would say, treating them as absolutely toxic, uh, which is the case with many Jewish responses that see them as stereotypical and as promoting a kind of anti-Semitic uh, image um, of Jews. Um, and as seeing them as a positive, uh, as a, a, a bringers of luck, as seeing them as innocuous or viewing them kind of indifferently and taking a kind of ethnographic approach to them. Um, so there, there are these, these various attitudes. And I think that in Erica Lehrer's work where she actually um, developed an exhibition that would raise awareness of the range of attitudes towards them, values attributed to them, uh, place them in ethnographic historical contexts, showed a wide range of them, not all of them stereotypical. I think that her, uh, the ways in which she used exhibition to address not only what was in the museum's collection, but also objects in the world. And that is for me one of the most interesting aspects of the phenomenon, which is to say that these are objects that are alive and circulating in the world and a, a, a very interesting question is, what is the role of museums in bringing awareness to the ambivalence and to the difficulty of these objects? And uh, I, would, I would conclude 
um, in term, before turning to the questions and the bibliography, I would conclude by uh, pointing out a very interesting intervention. And uh, this is a project uh, called Lucky Jews uh, Festival. It's an alternative Jewish festival uh, to the Krakow Jewish Culture Festival in Krakow, where the artists actually dress up and restage the image, the portrait, and then engage visitors who are completely baffled to see images that they are very familiar with and the live um, and sort of a live performance of it. And so uh, by way of the questions, uh, the questions that I would ask are, um, what are some of the exhibition strategies that we can use to deal with objects that are toxic for some, innocuous or positive for others? And what is the role of those exhibitions in raising awareness of these objects in the world? Um, then um, I would ask how might artists offer alternative strategies to the ones that we normally use as curators. Um, and, uh, and for example, uh, the, 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 in the case of festivals, um, and also what are some of the live strategies, whether they're alternative tours, but also I think in the case of the Worcester Art Museum, um, they, they have to do with the rewriting of labels. And then uh, what for me is very, very important is the relationship between these objects in the world and these objects in the museum. In terms of what I would recommend for reading, I would recommend Erica Lair's book, Lucky Jews. I would recommend Fred Wilson, the catalog for, for Fred Wilson's exhibition, Mining the Museum. I would recommend Mirroring Evil from the Jewish Museum. And I would recommend the new Philip Gustin Now catalog. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Kailani Polzak, who is assistant professor in the history of art and visual culture at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much to Daniela and Nancy for inviting me to be part of this. As we are here to discuss difficult histories, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yup tribe and on land which today the Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people who are taken to the missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization are currently working hard to restore to traditional stewardship practices and to heal from trauma. I have selected as my difficult object, next slide please, a cover of a magazine that was published in the United States in December 1893 Judge Magazine was a periodical that focused on political satire, and this particular image critiques President Grover Cleveland's position that his foreign minister had wrongly fomented and supported an annexationist coup against the sovereign nation of Hawaii in 1893. At the time this image was published, many in the United States anticipated that Cleveland would offer a statement supporting the return of Queen Lilo Kalani to the throne of an independent Hawaii. And he delivered that address about 16 days after this magazine cover was published. This particular image, and there are many others like it, relies on stereotyped features from a visual vocabulary of anti-Blackness in order to suggest that Lilio Kalani is unfit to govern. And indeed, I encourage you all to run a quick image search of Lilio Kalani to see how little resemblance, if any, there are between this particular picture and her portraits. Noe Noe Silva has found that the artist of this cartoon, Victor Gillum, drew many elements from cartoons produced during the British Wars to annex the Zulu Kingdom. But we also know that it cannot be separated from images of minstrelsy and derogatory representations of Black Americans after the Civil War. I thought it germane to this workshop because its display was something that my co-curator Sonic Coggins and I debated while we were organizing an exhibition about Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts on Mohican lands. Um, so an exhibition about Williams College and the Kingdom of Hawaii in the 19th century. Several prominent annexationists and annexation advocates had attended Williams College and many of their papers arguing for annexation were in the college archives. We considered including this particular magazine cover to offer a visual counterpart to their verbal arguments and to indicate how many of those arguments for the US occupation of Hawaii were more often grounded in racial arguments about character than in alliance or protection, which is what we had found many of our colleagues in particular had assumed while we were preparing the exhibition. 
Ultimately, we, we decided to display just those texts and we juxtaposed them instead with official state images that had been commissioned by the Hawaiian monarchs to represent their reigns. There are many images like this from the 1890s that purport to depict Hawaiians and particularly the Okalani, and they range from satirical magazine covers like the one I'm showing you today to even clothing store advertisements. They were also made in relation to the US military action, um, mil military actions in the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. And so they offer a lens into visual culture um, and race as well as American empire. Ultimately, my co-curator Sonnet and I decided against including this cover in our exhibition because we were concerned that we couldn't provide sufficient context, support, and warning to prevent our community members, and we were especially concerned about our Kanaka Maoli, or Native Hawaiian, and Black community members from feeling harmed by its inclusion. This decision was made in dialogue with students and colleagues and was particularly informed by conversations that were held after a performance of a play on the Williams campus had left many feeling that the education of non-Black audiences had been accomplished by spectacularizing Black trauma. And I give you all of this context, not because I want to revisit that decision and I want you to assure me that we did the right thing, but because I think it reveals um, some larger issues that I would appreciate us discussing, discussing in this context. So next slide, please. So how can museums educate visitors about complex and harmful histories without reinflicting harm? And put another way, how do we balance what Amy Lone Tree has termed speaking the hard truths of colonialism with practices of care? And I'm thinking in particular of community care. And that framing of the question is owed to a conversation with someone who's a, an esteemed colleague to many of us, Dina Liebson, who I believe is in our workshop today. And I think that question also entails us to ask, for whom are we curating these histories? My second question is to ask, um, to ask our group, is that one approach to revisiting these histories with criticality, and we've seen this increasingly often, has been to put older objects and works of art in dialogue with contemporary artworks. And there are many virtues to this approach. It allows us to have more inclusive galleries. We can often approach artists from communities that have been harmed, who have not historically been represented in the museum space. But given the wealth of experience in this workshop, are there other approaches that the participants would like to discuss? Are our historical objects, texts, and interpretive methods up to it? Or should we, should we be consistently relying on contemporary art? Thank you. And yes, sorry, these are my resources. Noe Noe Silva is who I recommended for reading about um, the American occupation of Hawaii, in particular on the caricatures. There's an excellent teaching resource that was recently published last month by Haloha Johnston and Ashley Corin about racist caricature in Hawaii through the Smithsonian's um, Asian Pacific American Center. And then on museums and communities, I've recommended, again, the classic Amy Lone Tree Decolonizing Museums, the mass action, toolkit that is available online, and then a recent article by Yasomi Mwamalu on the limits of care and knowledge about museums. And uh, our next speaker is Nancy Um, Professor of Art History and Associate Dean of Harper College at Binghamton University. Hi, thank you so much, Daniela. And um, I think I'll just start with some words of introduction about my object, if I could have the first slide, please. So around the year 1725, a boat set off from Canton, China, heading, we believe, for the port of Batavia, the capital of the Dutch seaborne empire, now Jakarta in Indonesia. When that vessel reached the southernmost point of Vietnam, it caught fire and we are not sure how, but we do believe that that fire probably led to its sinking. In 1998 and 99, the boat's cargo, which largely consisted of porcelain vessels, was recovered from the depths of the South China Sea. Now called the Kamau shipwreck, this vessel is presumed to have been piloted by a Chinese crew. So the extreme heat from that fire permanently fused together some of the items on board, as you can see in the slide. And so now these brown porcelain cups are fixed in the stacked configuration, one nested within the other, which is the way that they were originally packed for shipping. Um, they were also placed in wooden barrels, which undoubtedly contributed to the high heat of the combustion 
And over the course of nearly two centuries underwater, coral grew on the surface of this amalgamation and shells also adhered to it, thus constituting a new sculptural form. It's um, also worth noting that the brown glazed porcelain, uh, which is usually called Batavia ware, and it's of course much more distinct from the more common blue and white palette that we are all uh, very used to for Chinese porcelain. Um, but it's also notable because the surface is considerably rougher and it's matte, um, and that made it more susceptible to marine accretions than those uh, porcelain wares that were covered with a transparent glaze. So now let me dig in a little bit deeper into our understanding of this sea sculpture as it's called through um, some larger and broader questions if I could have the next slide. Um, so I'll start with the issue of temporality um, and chronology. Uh, shipwrecks are usually described erroneously as time capsules, which is meant to highlight their status as single period sites that do not possess stratified layers. But clearly the Kamau shipwreck was a site of transformation as, as much as it was a site of preservation. So in the context of the museum, how can we conceive of and describe the various temporal stages of an object like this one's life, while also taking into account the differential character of those stages, which in this case may have been intentional, accidental, or natural. Um, and let's also think about geography. Many porcelain objects made in 18th century China were produced for export and thus engineered with long distance travel built into their itineraries. And in this case, this included a Chinese origin, likely at the site of Jing Zhen, uh, a Chinese boat, an Indonesian entrepot, as well as Vietnam as a mere waypoint. And indeed, we know that some of the Kamau cargo was intended for Northern Europe, and that some of these goods were probably even pre-ordered um, for sites like Amsterdam or Stockholm. It's hard to be uh, certain. And now the bulk of these goods are housed in Vietnamese museums, enshrined as a part of that local history, which of course was a place that was not included on the original itinerary of this boat. So then how do we calibrate and weigh an object's relationships to these various geographical sites that may have been connected to the objects or have come to be associated with them? Um, and now I want to talk about excavation, uh, which is a pretty complex terrain that I can only touch upon. But I'll just say that archaeologists generally reject the approach that is taken by commercial entities in the uh, excavation of underwater sites, which favor speed over study and hinge upon the profit gain from the sale of finds. So this site was excavated by a Vietnamese commercial salvage firm with oversight by an academic team. And the operations were particularly challenging because of extremely tumultuous weather, rough waters, and continual looting. After the salvage operations concluded, Vietnamese museums were given the rights to acquire the pieces that they desired from the recovered items. Um, and then the remaining 76,000 objects, altogether there were 130,000 objects excavated, but uh, the remaining 76,000 objects were were then auctioned off by Sotheby's in 2007. And as you can imagine, they included a lot of duplicates. Um, and this is how the DNA and other collections acquired them. So what are the ethics of display of salvage shipwreck material, which has been obtained through methods that are subject to both censure and sanction? And um, the last question that I'll be asking is um, about cargo, which is one of my great interests. And so in its current form, this composite sculpture contrasts the much more frequent presentation of porcelain vessels, which usually entails a certain amount of pristine singularization. These strategies end up implicitly valorizing those items that made it successfully to their destination points, um, while also uh, giving a place to those items that, of course, have remained both intact and undamaged over the generations. By contrast, the sea sculpture exemplifies the condition of being in transit, while also crystallizing the status of the objects that compose it as mass-produced cargo items, rather than as treasured items or even functional domestic objects. In this way, this sea sculpture to me is quite exemplary in materially capturing those fleeting aspects of the material trade, which are often conveyed for an object, usually in kind of accompanying text that sits outside of the object. So as a larger question, I just want to ask how we can highlight or feature the circumstances of conveyance and the means of mobility for those things that were in fact engineered for motion, but have come to rest quite statically in a museum like these goods. 
Um, and if we can just go to the last slide. Um, I have provided some references, but I decided uh, not to use written work. There's a huge body of literature on topics that I brought up. And in fact, it was too difficult to make choices. So I decided to um, uh, just choose some more recent examples of porcelain um, that uh, reflect on the transnational, mobile, mutable, as well as the salvage history of this particular medium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Our last speaker is Winnie Wong, who is Associate Professor of Rhetoric and the History of Art at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you, Daniela. You can all hear me? Um, wonderful. Thank you to the panelists as well. So many of your objects have um, already taught me a lot about the objects I'm about to show you. Um, and in particular, wonderful to follow Nancy's because my object will also come from Canton intended um, for the Netherlands. Um, so one of the centerpieces of my research is um, tracking the idea of the faceless and anonymous Chinese worker. Um, the idea and actually quite common experience that many people in the world hold that Chinese people all look the same and that you cannot distinguish them by their names. Um, this is an ethical and political and historical problem um, that I won't get into here, but um, I think it's also an artistic one and that's mostly what I wanna talk about. So um, next slide, please. Um, this is my um, object. They are a pair of um, seated figures um, currently at the Royal Ethnographic Museum in the Netherlands. Um, there are actually uh, several other known um, similar pairs, not exact, um, in various museums in Europe and in the United States. Um, the reason I find this pair of um, figures difficult is because they are so appealing. Um, everything we know of the practice of how these two figures were made suggest that they are not portraits of living people. Um, but I think, I hope you can see from the detail I'm showing you, um, these two, um, like the others, are uh, sort of incredible for their naturalism and their apparent um, ability to show the individuality of two um, possible people. Um, but everything we know about how these were made were probably um, that they were assembled by artisans who were um, more likely used to depicting the dead um, through stock types and figures and certainly without ever having looked at the deceased. Um, that is the probable understanding of this pair of objects, but the very appealing um, realism in these um, faces here um, also suggests to me at the same time that we cannot discount the fact that they are possibly real portraits of individuals living out at, during the time that these portraits were made. Um, the fact that these were um, objects made for, probably made for export um, to Europe um, also complicates the matter because they were probably made therefore for um, buyers who thought they were indeed portraits. Um, so my questions essentially, if the next slide, have to really, um, I simplified them, but they, they're meant to question the value and power of resemblance, something that I think we attach a great deal of, um, of um, ethical power to in terms of relating to real historical individuals and yet something which I think in this case it's very possible um, that the artisans themselves may have not. Um, so my questions are simply one is a portrait not a portrait and what would it mean um, for portraits to be simulated um, and how would we even um, visually or historically determine that for our own eyes. Um, and, and again, um, echoing some of the issues brought up by previous panelists, um, when is a representation of the dead actually a representation of the living, which we might have to treat as a representation of the dead due to the history of its um, circulation. For um, readings, I have only two. 
um, in the next slide, they um, um, sort of circulate around the op opposition here. Um, one is um, a, a essentially a history of ancestor portraits, um, which would um, suggest that these uh, portraits that I've shown you here are not portraits in the way that we understand portraits. Um, and the other book, um, uh, Letter Roses, 10,000 Things, um, deals with a, a very broad argument of how Chinese um, art is made across media and millennia in a way that um, um, also sort of uh, disembodies the individual maker and the individual subjects. Um, from things, from, from genres um, such as portraits. So I'll end there. Thank you so much, Winnie. Um, what an amazing uh, oh, group and range of objects. Um, we are, uh, let me uh, stop this share. We are all back. Uh, we are quickly recalibrating uh, because uh, we are at 1.15 and uh, we have 15 minutes. So we have decided uh, via furious texting uh, to, we're not going to have the breakout groups. We don't have time for that. We have time just for a few uh, responses uh, from the speakers or questions uh, from uh, the uh, uh, group as a whole uh, until before going on to uh, the closing comments uh, from the people we have who have committed bravely to do so. Uh, so um, I am going to ask that you, uh, if you are a speaker and uh, you would like to respond to uh, um, the, the other presenters who just spoke, uh, you raise your blue hand through the participants uh, function uh, and that if you are a, um, uh, you have not spoken yet, but you have a question or a comment that you would like to pose, uh, you do the same. So uh, that you raise the uh, blue hand through Zoom. Uh, and that will uh, let us know that you want to speak and uh, we will ask you to unmute yourself. Change of plans. I have a million questions if nobody else wants to start, but I am sure others do too. Okay, then I will take uh, the unmuted person's prerogative and um, bring up one of the things that uh, I found was really interesting thinking about the difficult objects uh, that you all presented in relation to each other, which is a question of temporality and historicity. Uh, many of the difficulties you presented had to do with objects that uh, go in and out of the category of difficulty at different uh, moments, uh, becoming uh, don't start off as difficult and become difficult. They don't become difficult. And one of the questions was, uh, this is part of their biography, but is this part of what a museum uh, presents? Or is this something that happens that is better tackled elsewhere? Uh, uh, for uh, some of the reasons were brought up where uh, context, uh, capacity, uh, bandwidth, uh, visitor experience, uh, but how to uh, uh, address the, the, the fact that any label or wall text is only ever uh, mentioning one moment in time and that the difficulty happens often over time. Uh, so this is, is something that I would love to hear from any of the presenters. 
Uh, Laurel, you, uh, you can unmute yourself. All right, no, you've, you've hit on something that I've been thinking of for a bit, uh, because I work in a museum where many of our exhibits have stood for far, far too long. But it has to do with museum technique that in, in an ethnographic museum in particular, or in a museum that presumes to do science is the place where I work does, um, we all know that human culture is a dynamic thing. We all know that science and the natural world is a dynamic thing. And yet the techniques we fall into to present it get fixed and very quickly out of date in terms of the stories we want to tell. And I'm wondering if there aren't you know, ways of thinking through the exhibit, the notion of what an exhibit should be itself, that on the very technical, on the very mechanical, on the very material side, aren't more mobile. I was intrigued by Barbara's comment, alternative strategies, um, bringing in artists. Just, I think we're at a moment where, you know, it's one thing to do what the Met did, 150 years of mea culpa up in their galleries right now. It's another to think about, you know, how can we present something that is in fact fluid, that reflects our change, that is easy and cost effective. And that's what it comes down to in presenting, uh, you know, new evolving emergent ways of wanting to present things. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to uh, now uh, invite uh, Mary Miller, uh, who had agreed to uh, offer uh, brief comments uh, to please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniela. This is oh, been, there you are. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> um, uh, it's been terrific to be at this uh, with and to hear these talks this afternoon. I'm going to try to hit a few completely unrelated points. And um, one is that the 21st century means that one can't hide behind the text anymore. So I'm thinking particularly of the object Dennis started us off with. You can't start by trying to contextualize it. The picture goes viral. So I think this is actually part of the story of why things matter so much in the 21st century, um, particularly things that were um, live on the edge of kitsch um, and how this, uh, they, they've, uh, they've escaped any kind of decorative notion. The next thing you know, they are turning into hideous memes. So I do think that's, um, I don't have an answer for it. I just think it's part of the, the um, interesting problem. And I also think one of the very interesting things that I've heard from a number of you today um, is the, the problem of capturing time. That is the object that changes in its meaning and perception through time, but also in the diorama, which as, uh, as it froze and intentionally a kind of anesthetized in a, a almost like a film, um, a certain moment of indigeneity, nevertheless had a time loop embedded in it in a kind of um, almost cinematic way. And this is, again, pulls me back to the danger and in, uh, of the kitschy objects for surely what happens with the Jewish figurines in Poland is the kind of action figure, um, which is a, a place the museum doesn't really want to be. Um, and uh, especially, uh, I, I won't belabor fakes, but they are particular um, of great interest to me. I do, though, think that time is one of the really interesting things about the Vietnamese archaeology, because you cannot see that object without seeing all of the ways that time has accrued to it. And it seems to me it's almost a kind of perfect object that a museum tries to say that we are allowing time to change and mutate the things we see. Um, uh, even as things that were not of particular value become valorized because of the way time has built its shell around them. Um, I have lots of other things to say, but that was three minutes, so I think I'll stop right there. <laughs>
Thank you so much. That was super helpful. And I am uh, so grateful to you for uh, minding time. Uh, Fernando Dominguez Rubio, um, we would love to hear from you. Well, that, that's quite a task. Um, so uh, let's see. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for this respite. We are drawn in here with forced homeschooling. So it's actually great that for a while we can just pretend that doesn't exist and talk about other things. Uh, so uh, I have actually uh, um, questions more than anything, trying to uh, put together the different presentations which have been great. Uh, the first question that I had is that, you know, um, what I was thinking is that most of the objects that we, we've, we've seen are kind of self-evident objects. So they are actually, their status as, as objects is not even at stake. Uh, so the problem is how do we display them? And I was thinking if uh, we may also ask what happens when the very status of something as an object is at stake. Uh, and it seems to me that part of what happens, part of the difficulty that museums face is that it is difficult to turn something into an object in the first place. Uh, and that has to do, for example, with how to trap them in time, how to stabilize them. I was thinking, for example, you know, on digital artworks and how difficult it is for museums to acquire them in the first place and to present them as an object. So that's one case in which the objecthood of something or performances uh, is uh, complicated to begin with. Or I was thinking about uh, those subjects that are almost at their threshold or of legibility. Things are about to lose their identity as subjects. And then we don't know if they are an object or they should be just uh, deaccessioned. And the, the difficulties that that presents for the museum as well. And, and I was thinking also uh, in some of the cases in which uh, the naming something an object is already problematic. Uh, so, you know, the garment that probably people would contend that that is not an object, is something else. And even naming it as an object is itself uh, problematic. So putting all together, I was thinking that, you know, whether the question is not just how do we display objects and the difficulty of displaying them, uh, but how do museums produce something that is legible as an object in the first place? And then I have a, a second question that, uh, that kind of um, builds from that, uh, which is uh, about, you know, the different, I mean, when the emphasis is, I think that, uh, you know, many of the questions that have emerged uh, arise when we think that the uh, end point of display is to display an object. But thinking about what Barbara was saying, what if the emphasis is not to display an object, but to dis display the controversy that's uh, around something uh, that, uh, and how that comes to be an object. So what you are presenting is not the object, but the controversy uh, uh, that, uh, that surrounds something. Uh, and, and, and I was thinking, you know, if uh, you opt for that route, uh, then you end up with a lot of uncomfortable questions. And I was thinking, you know, how easy it is to think of difficult objects as negatives, uh, as something that has to be solved, and how uh, probably more productive is to think that difficulty is something that the, what the museum has to dwell in. What is probably the role of the museum is to uh, allow that difficulty, not to resolve it, but to present it. And knowing that as some of the cases have uh, uh, shown, you know, even if you care to uh, uh, reach to every single one, even if you care and you want to uh, solve uh, or be clear about your intentions, they're bound to be misinterpreted and more so in the 21st century, as Mary has said. Uh, and uh, what I was thinking is, you know, what if difficulty is understood as a productive way to the museum, a productive and uncomfortable way for the museum to engage with in a state of something that has to be solved? Does it? That is great. That is more than enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marnie uh, Sandwise, I see you. So I'll be very, very brief. Thank you to all the presenters and special thanks for the fabulous reading lists that you've provided me with. I'm going to be living off of those for a long time. So I'm a historian, so I think about stories. And just a few general thoughts here. Uh, we talked a little bit about objects whose stories become unattached from them. And I'm thinking in particular about the very first presentation about the vase related to the Amistad. 
When that face was produced, there was a story. People understood its connection to this particular project. People talk though quite a lot about stories that never become unattached. That is the stories that are held within descendant communities who uh, are now being widely consulted by museums to help understand these difficult projects. I think I just wanna make one, highlight the, the tension between those two ways of thinking about the stories that attach to these things, the stories that were there and get lost, the stories that seemingly don't get lost, but also raise some difficult questions about what it means to consult with these uh, descendant communities. I think it's possible that we run a danger of thinking with the knowledge that's uh, given to us by these communities at the expense of thinking about it. Um, knowledge is dynamic. People's understandings of their past are dynamic. And I, I think that all of us uh, really have an obligation to think about the knowledge held within these communities as something itself is that it is dynamic and has changed over time. And to understand that we're wrestling with what that knowledge looks like at this particular moment, and perhaps push ourselves to think about whether there are any ways to, to historicize that knowledge or to understand what it might have looked like in the past. And I'll just leave it right there. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, Debbie Silverman, last but definitely not least, in a grove, you need to unmute yourself. Hold on. Can you do that? Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, well, uh, it's hard to be the last, but there's so much richness and thinking to be done. I'd like to just point out uh, three things in the short time that I have, which is some of it follows up on what Fernando just raised, but it relates to some of the range of presentations which were fascinating and wonderful and also raises a number of questions. The first is epistemological, which has to do with uh, how do we define objects? It tends to be uh, in art history, visual culture, architecture, we have artifact, object, biographies, transmission. These are terms that float across disciplines and within art history, painting has become an object. So I just like to think about objects in terms of how they're defined and how they become canonized as a kind of status of knowledge. The second is that all of these objects and the wonderful presentations were in the material or applied arts, with one exception of the print, if I'm remembering correctly. So it tends, I was struck by the Western, non-Western issues in the presentations, and especially one of the things about difficult objects is we tend not to prom problematize on the other side, the European side, presuming that we know that primitivity and European projections, we've solved that set of questions. But there are many dimensions of difficult objects on the European side, which are hiding in plain sight. I've done quite a lot of work on ivories in symbolism that are just detached from the stories of the raw materials from which they came in the Congo. So that epistemological question in relation to the geography and hierarchy of Western and non-Western arts as well as to the hierarchy of painting and the quote unquote material arts or ethnographic slash visual arts. The second question I'd like to raise is related to two things that I believe Matthew and Kailani raised as well as Barbara, which is the term emotionality, emotion, trauma, inflicting harm and care. So in the status of these objects in relation to their communities that Marnie just raised as well as Kailani, how does contextualization then, as Kailani said, not reinflict harm? This is a very raw debate in museums about how one recreates or restores a history that has been obliterated, especially histories of violence, without then affecting visitors and the museum uh, curators as well with that form of re-traumatization. So we can leave that aside, but that's very active in the world of African art and African presentations in colonial museums and how to bridge the gap of time. Um, the third question uh, or issue I have has to do with what Barbara raised and Matthew as well about inside the museum and out in the world outside the museum. I think that was very 
helpful in thinking about the lives of these objects in relation to contemporary practice. And I believe, it, I can't remember who brought up the interdependent conversations with contemporary art and contemporary artists in response to these collections and objects, and particularly with the communities that have been either obliterated or damaged, artists from those communities are now being activated to respond. One of them at this very moment in the Africa Traverin Museum in Belgium, a Congolese artist placed new kinds of art and he immediately got the resistance from the old colonial paratroopers who are trying to sue the museum for even including some of the history that was left. That's an extreme example. But we have this problem of activation and conversation where contextualization recreates this dynamic problem of resistance, protest, and violence. So the, the, I just want to make one larger uh, issue about ethics and politics. I do think we somehow have to think about, we're in a very different world now. This is not business as usual in terms of the academic exercise of institutional critique and museums moving forward. And one of the ways that um, I just want to see how people can think about how it is that the shock and acceleration of political time now, even in terms of the issues of race and systemic racism, colonial amnesia, there, there's been an eruption that has shifted very quickly the mainstream sets of thinking. So is the notion of difficult objects really opening up to lots of other very broader problems and questions that are totalistic and may undermine how we think about museums at all? as spaces of didactic contextualization, all the sophisticated issues of the impact, emotionality, and ethics, and then epistemological, how does, is that in some discordance with the sort of shock of the new domain, which is a very public political conversation? So those are just some of my, but thank you all for your presentations. I learned a tremendous amount and uh, it's, it, it's very rich and terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie, and, and I really appreciate where you ended. As uh, many of you uh, uh, know, uh, I, uh, we started having these conversations about difficult objects about three years ago and thinking about this uh, category uh, that we liked because it was confrontational and opaque, and we thought that could be very pro productive. Uh, uh, to open up a lot of questions, and that is why we did not uh, try to define what is a difficult object or to specify or to ask you to uh, speak about uh, one kind of difficulty. Uh, we chose to have the, the biggest mess possible uh, to try to generate uh, as comprehensive a list as of types of difficulty that we could. Uh, but uh, this uh, conversation, uh, which was going originally to happen in uh, last spring, uh, is happening now and it's happening on uh, Zoom. And so uh, it's happening at an entirely different moment when what difficulty means has is entirely changed. And, uh, um, it compromises, it both complements and compromises the premise that we started with. Um, I, uh, I know we are five minutes over time. I want to thank all the speakers and the commentators and everybody who was contributing also through the chat. Um, uh, and we will uh, make the um, bibliography and the chat uh, available, uh, we will share that uh, uh, with everyone who registered. I am also going to uh, put uh, a link here uh, on the chat. Uh, it's for a sign up if you would like to uh, be uh, uh, informed of future meetings uh, around this, this uh, theme, please just uh, add your uh, email and we will let you know. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, our uh, time has more than uh, run out. Thank you 
everyone so much for coming. I am going to ask the, the speakers and the commentators at the end if they have a couple of minutes to not quite leave yet, uh, just for, for, for one more minute. Uh, but uh, thank you so much to everyone.